Fatality, my diamonds that cold. Versace chunks, I hit my backstroke. Knock on the door. She had the back, bro. Welcome back to Houdini is Hip. In the previous part, we looked at meshing our fluid surface and we looked at adding bubbles and foam. We also cleaned up our simulation to the point that we were happy with. And we can now go ahead to the final step of this project and that's just going to be rendering. So if you'd like to continue from where I have left off, then you can go ahead and use the part three underscore start file that I've attached below. You can find it in the description. So first thing that we're gonna do is just work on a few things that we're going to need for rendering. We're also gonna have to do some cleanup. And as we go, I'm going to show you some of the issues that we have and how we might tackle it if we were actually working on this as a production shot. I'm already aware of some of the issues that are gonna show up. There's gonna be things like some objects that are gonna come through our actual glass surface. There's gonna be issues with refraction. There's gonna be loads and loads of issues. And I wanna show you how you would tackle them live as you're going through the project and just kind of what each little issue is and how it's fixed. So to start with, let's go ahead and just add a new geo node and we're gonna make a ground plane. I'm gonna show you a nice little technique and it's just an infinite backdrop. So we're just gonna go ahead and drop a grid over here. We're also gonna object merge in our glass for the rendering. So go over to glass, glass render, this over here. And we have our grid over here, right? First thing that we're going to do is just move this over a bit. So we know that our fluid is gonna come in from the side. We can take a look over here with our fluid meshing. Let's just use our particles over here to see where we are. Okay, we know that this is the angle that we wanna view it from. So let's go into our ground plane and we can just narrow this grid. We're gonna narrow it over here to about five and three, something like that. Then just do 30 columns, 50 rows, right? Something like that. We're also going to just move this over. So we can just move it over that way just to give it some space towards the back, right? So we're gonna have our camera more or less over here. And so what we want is just this endless background, right? Now to do that, we're going to use a bend node. But before we do, let's make sure that this ground plane lines up with our glass correctly. So remember before we had the match size that we used for getting our glass to the ground plane, there's actually another useful case for match size. And that is with two objects like this. So into the first input, you take the object that you wanna move. Into the second input, you want the one that you're going to be matching it with. And over here, you can choose the justification. We want our ground plane to be right at the bottom of our glass. And so to do that, all we're going to do is center Y min, right? So as you can see, it's now almost exactly there. But we don't want it so close. We want a little bit of space. So we're just going to do an offset of negative 0.001, right? Like that. So it's the tiniest amount of space between our glass and our ground plane. So you can see that it's also moved our grid back to the center. So we can just switch off the justification for X and Z by doing none and none, and that'll just move it like that. Perfect. Now let's go ahead and use a bend node over here. So just drop a bend node. And over here, we just wanna bend the background up. So we're gonna choose a vector direction to bend it in. So under capture direction, let's go negative one. And then let's just also move it away from where the glass actually is. So the origin, we're gonna move over this way to about negative 0.5. We can then bend this up over here, just like that. And this is a really nice technique. This is often done in product photography where you just want this background that seems to be endless. And so you just give it a gradual gradient, just like that. And you can make this even more gradual and you can change the capture length and things like that. So it's more shallow and that's pretty nice, right? Okay, cool. So that's what we have over there. We can just use a null and this is just going to be our ground plane. So ground plane out, upper level. Let's just hide all of these. And we're gonna go over to the stage level. So go over here to OBJ, just click on stage, and we can set this to the Solaris desktop, right? So we have this over here. We're gonna minimize our scene graph tree. And over here, we can use a SOP import. We're gonna bring in our ground plane. So go to ground, ground plane out. Remember to rename this over here, just to ground, because in our scene graph tree over here, we want it to be aptly named, right? Okay, so let's duplicate this, and let's also bring in the glass. So rename this one to glass and then just change what we're bringing in over here. So glass render, just like that. There's our two pieces of geometry. Okay, so now let's set up a camera over here, somewhere that's going to look good. So perhaps just like this, right? Camera right over there. Make some adjustments to it until we're happy, something like that. And if your ground plane isn't wide enough, you can change its size over here. So let's just go back to the object level, ground, and let's just increase its scaling, right? So we'll just do five, and that should be fine, right? Back to the stage level, cool. So we just have a camera and we have our scene set up over here. 
The next thing that we're going to do is just drop a comma render node. So go over here to comma, plug this in right over here. We can go down to here and just change this to the XBU engine and then just go over here to comma XBU. And just like that, we'll have our render going. Of course, we don't have any materials. We don't have any lights. So let's go ahead and just add a light. We're going to use a dome light right over here. You can put it anywhere above the comma render settings. I'm just going to put it over here. And that's just going to give you a very uniform light. The other thing that I'm going to do is just crop this to a square image, right? So I actually don't want all of this extra stuff on the side. So we're going to go over to our camera node under view. We're just going to change the aspect ratio to a one by one square, right? Like that. I'm just going to zoom in to reframe this. Perfect. Then on the comma render settings, it will automatically give you this height and width because it's computing based on the camera's aspect ratio. Okay, that's cool. And now we can go ahead and start adding some materials. Let's go ahead and use a material library right over here. And in this material library, we're gonna have to create a few materials. Please ensure that you are using the latest version of Houdini 20. In fact, if you can try to get anything after this, so I have 20.0.547. I was having issues with prior versions because they made some adjustments to the way that refractive materials work. So I was having some issues with refraction. So if you are facing the same issues, just make sure that your version of Houdini is this version or newer. Okay, so we're just gonna use a Karma Material Builder, and this is new to Houdini 20. Over here, we can just rename it to Ground, go inside, and you can see that this is actually a Material X node. So it's got all of the Material X nodes over here. This is just a bit different to how it used to be before. We didn't actually have a Karma Material node before. Okay, so we're just gonna make this ground plane basically black. I'm gonna go over to specular, decrease the specularity, and increase the roughness to something like 0 0.9. I'm gonna go up a level, and on this material library, I'm gonna auto fill materials, assign to geometry, assign it to forward slash ground, and there's our ground in our scene, right? So our ground now has a material. Of course, you can play around with it, perhaps decreasing the roughness, things like that, but that's fine for now. Okay. Next thing that we're going to do is just another Karma Material Builder. This one is going to be for glass. And inside of here, we're going to go ahead and work on our transmission. So go to transmission and push this up. So this is for refractive materials. So we're talking about water, we're talking about glass, diamond, crystal, any of that stuff, right? And how this works is it actually takes the IOR from the specular settings over here. IOR is just the index of refraction. It talks about how a particular material refracts the light that's coming into it. If you set this to a value of one, then there's no refraction. The higher you go, the greater the refraction. And you can actually get a list of all of the different settings for IOR. If you just do a quick Google search, you can find IOR for different materials, and you'll eventually learn what the IOR for different materials should be. For example, most types of glass are going to be anywhere between 1.4 and 1.5, whereas water is going to be something like 1.33. So it's going to change depending on the material that you're trying to mimic. So over here, we can keep ours at 1.5, but I might go a bit lower to about 1.4, something like that. And I'm going to go up a level, auto fill materials, assign to material forward slash glass. So there you can see, we now have a glass material. The only thing is that it's quite rough, and that's because the roughness on our glass material by default under specularity is going to be 0 0.2. Just drop this to zero so that you can have something that looks like that. Okay, I'm just gonna hide my light preview over there. And let's go down to our dome light over here. The thing about most of the lights and things that we're gonna have in our scene is that when we're working with glass, the reflection on the glass is very important, right? So choosing an HDRI that gives you some interesting reflections is very important. So I'm gonna go over to the textures over here and I'm going to go ahead and choose Blue Photo Studio 8K. You can go to polyhaven.com. I have mentioned them in the past. That's where I get most of these HDRIs from for these tutorials. They're really good quality and you can just find a nice indoor one and use that. Just give it a moment to figure it out and there. So that's what you'll have, right? We can increase the exposure on this up until it starts to look a bit more interesting, something like that. And now something that I like to do is just add a light blocker directly in front of the glass because you have all of these lights that are reflecting and they can actually kind of take away from the look of your scene. So what I'm going to do is just add a grid over here. So just a grid. And we're just gonna drop it behind the camera. We can even just call it light blocker over here. Plug it in over here and just change its scale. So we're gonna make it something like 0.2, move it over here just behind the camera rotate it around, something like that, right? And then what we wanna do is just assign a material to it. 
So we can just duplicate our ground material over here and just call this light blocker. And inside of here, auto full materials assigned to forward slash light blocker, right? Cool. So if we look to our camera now, you can see that some of these reflections are cut out. And if we increase the scale on our light blocker, it'll cut out more and more of those reflections, right? And this is nice because as we start working with the simulation, we're not going to want all of these reflections on the front of the glass. So you can change the dimensions of this for whatever you want it to look like. I'm just gonna move this back a bit, move that up a bit. Cool, right? Something like that. Okay, so now we have our glass and we have our ground, but we don't really have anything else in our scene. Also, our glass is a bit too perfect, so we need to get around to adding some roughness and scratches and things like that to really sell the realism of it. Same thing with the background. You often may want to add some distortion or noise to the background, just so that doesn't look so perfect. And you can make loads and loads of changes to your background depending on what you want. Okay, but let's get going with the actual water. That's what we're actually interested in for this tutorial. So I'm gonna go ahead and disable my glass over here. And then I'm going to duplicate it, call this one fluid surface, plug it in over here. Go ahead and fetch our fluid surface. So from fluid meshing, go ahead and take the fluid surface out and unhide this, right? So we'll just disable that bypass. And that's all that we have, right? So we can reposition our camera now that we see where our fluid is, something like that. Cool. Okay, so it doesn't really look like anything right now. That's because it has no material and it has no motion blur. Motion blur we'll get to shortly, but for now, let's just work on the actual material for it. Inside of the material library, we can go ahead and just duplicate over our glass material and we can call this water. Inside of here, we're going to go to our material standard surface over here, and we're just gonna set the index of refraction to 1.33, right? And really, that's all we're really gonna focus on for now. We don't need anything else to really add to this. That's it. So we can go up over here and just auto for materials, and underwater, we can do forward slash fluid surface. Now, you're going to perhaps notice this immediately, but if you look closely, you'll see that we have these little black spheres. And it might become more clear if I also add our glass to the scene, you'll see all of these like black artifacts, right? This is always going to happen when you're working with a lot of refractive materials. So what is that exactly? Well, that is the issue of our transmissive passes. If we go down over here to our camera render settings under the limits, right? So the limit is how many light bounces are allowed for a particular material or a particular element of our material, right? So I'm just gonna switch this back to Houdini GL and let's quickly go and explain this. Okay, so when we're looking at limits and we're going to be looking at the refraction limit, we're talking about what is the limit before a light ray gets cut off, right? What do I mean by this? If we're looking at refraction, we know that refraction is about light through a surface, right? So if I have light coming through the surface, it's going to travel through here, all right? This is our refractive surface over here and this could be a piece of glass. And we have no issues when we have this single piece of glass because the lights travel straight through it and we could see that when we had just our glass in the scene, it was fine, right? We didn't have any artifacts. The issue comes in when we start looking at the limits for this ray. If this ray has a limit of say two, right? Then that means it's allowed to pass through two refractive surfaces. So it can pass through two refractive surfaces and then that's its limit. But what happens if we have multiple refractive surfaces? So let's just say that we have one, two, three, four, and our limit is only two. Then this light ray is going to go through, it's gonna go through one, it's gonna go through two, and then it's not gonna go through this next one. So what it's actually going to return is just black, right? Because the light ray doesn't get all the way through the surface. In this situation over here, it goes all the way through, and it returns some value from the other side. Perhaps it hits a wall at the back over here. And this is what gets returned to the camera. That's what the camera sees. But in this situation, it's getting cut off because it's reached its limit, right? It's got a limit of two, but it's trying to get through more than two refractive surfaces. So what we can do is we can up the limit. We can say, okay, this is a scene that has a lot of refractive surfaces. So let's up our refractive limit to something like six, right? Maybe six. Then it can go through over here and over here come out the other side, all right? And so in this situation, you'll overcome the issue of it being cut off after hitting a limit. In our situation with our fluid, we're gonna have to have quite a few passes because in our situation, we could have the glass, we could have the fluid surface, then we could have a bubble and we could have another bubble behind it. Then we could have the back of the glass and the rest of the glass surface behind that, right? 
So it's going to have to make a lot of travels through this, right? It's going to have to have a fairly high limit to get through all of these different layers of transmissive material, right? To get all the way through, it's going to need a very high limit count. Now, of course, the downside to this is that the higher the limit, the more calculations, so the longer the render time. This is one of the downsides of having to render something with a lot of refractive materials. But fortunately, Karma XPU is actually incredibly fast, so we won't actually feel it that much. But in a lot of other renderers, this is extremely painful. This is going to cost you a lot of render time. You're going to end up with artifacts, things like fireflies, and it's just, it's a real pain. Fortunately, our render isn't going to have to suffer too much, and we can get around this issue of limits by just increasing our limits. So we're back in here, and on our comma render settings, you can see that we have our refraction limit of four. So if we go comma XPU over here, let's just test the two extremes, right? So let's see what happens if we have a refraction limit of one. Aha, so light can only travel through one refractive surface as is. So we had it at four, so let's try something high like 10. You can see that when we push it up to 10, this starts to now look like it should, right? There are still some issues. It's these artifacts down here, right? But we'll correct that, so we don't have to worry about it right now. That's an issue with our Boolean, but we'll fix that, right? So I just want you to focus on the rest of it for now. I'm gonna hide my glass surface, and this is what we have, right? So cool, that's the one part of it. However, we also wanna bring in our bubbles. So let's go ahead and just duplicate our fluid surface over here. We can just call this bubbles. And what we'll bring in is our secondary particles out. It's just these particles over here. So duplicate the water over and just call this bubbles. Now let's just assign this and see what we have. So autofill materials over here under bubbles. We're just gonna add this to the bubbles object, right? So we bring the object in, assign the material, comma XPU render. All right, so there we go. We have our bubbles being rendered over there. One thing that I do want you to keep in mind is that you may run into an error over here and it's going to tell you something like critical error. You're gonna to have to update your NVIDIA drivers if you are using a NVIDIA card. So you're going to have to get, I believe it's version 535 or newer. So at the time of recording, the newest version is 546. And if that still doesn't work, then you can do this over here with a render geometry properties. Oh, sorry, render geometry settings over here. Just do forward slash asterisk. And down here where we have caustics, so enable caustics, just set or create and leave it disabled. This is actually a little thing that I discovered back when this wasn't working for whatever reason. And somehow that kind of fixed things, right? That's just a very strange workaround that happens when you have these stacked um, refractive materials. That's one way to work around it. All right, you won't have to do this with every project. Trust me, it's usually fine. But if you do have that error, which I didn't in this situation, then that's one of the ways to fix it, right? I just wanted to bring that up because I have faced that issue in the past. Okay, so we have our bubbles and it's not looking too bad. We can skip ahead a bit and there you'll see something very strange happening, right? That over there is actually a single particle that's being rendered as a full sphere. The reason that's happening is because this geometry that we've created isn't actually cleaned. So go to your fluid meshing over here and down here after your Boolean, what happens is you sometimes have floating points that actually get rendered as particles, much like how we render these as little spheres, right? Even though they're just points, the same thing can happen with little pieces of geometry that have been cut off from the main piece of geometry. The way to fix this is to use a clean node over here. And you're going to see that it kind of breaks this, right? What we're gonna do is not remove degenerate primitives, but just remove unused points, right? So once we've done that, it should actually work. So here you can see we have 42,775 points. Before we did that, we had 42,776, right? So it's actually removing that one point that we're seeing. And if we go back to the stage level and do another render, that weird situation will have resolved itself, right? So now it works. Okay, so I just wanna show you some options that you do have for these bubbles over here. In our settings over here, we can go down to the geometry over here, and we do have this option to make our geometry thin walled. When we look at thin walled geometry, this is the idea of something like a bubble, right? This is actually exactly what it is. If you think of thin walled, it's treating the geometry as just a thin shell, not as a solid surface, right? So each of these bubbles are currently being viewed as solid little objects inside of this fluid. But if you set it to thin walled, it'll actually change that and they'll be treated more as hollow spheres, right? 
Now, I found that I actually don't like the look of having them as thin walled, even though it's technically correct. So I leave it disabled, right? Because I actually kind of like the look of having them like this. The other thing that you can do is also drive some roughness, right? So you can actually push up the roughness over here because these particles, you actually do want them to have a little bit of a frosty look to them, right? They're not actually going to be perfectly clear and see-through. So you can kind of mimic the idea of foam by increasing their roughness. Again, that's just an option. You don't have to do that. Okay, so we're looking good. The other thing that we need to bring in is our foam. So let's just move this up over here. And we can just go to Houdini GL, duplicate this. This is going to be our foam volume over here. And we're just gonna bring in that foam volume, foam volume out, right? So now we have that as well. In our material library, we're going to have to create a comma uniform volume material. And we can rename this to foam, right? Dive inside of here. You have the comma pyro shader and over here, we're not gonna change anything just yet because I want to show you what it looks like when you just use the defaults. So we're gonna say autofill materials, down here, foam, we're just gonna assign this to forward slash foam volume, right? Go over here, comma XBU, and you won't really notice anything just yet. So what we're going to do is just go into our foam material over here. We're gonna push up the density scale, and we're also going to push up the smoke brightness, right? Something like that. And there, that's gonna give you that thin layer of white foam. Now, something that I did actually experiment with and I quite liked, was a weird little technique. So what you can do is you can actually go to this over here where you have your volume. I'm just gonna press D to make the background dark. You can actually transfer an attribute over onto your fluid surface and use it to drive the opacity of the actual glass, right, of this fluid. And to do that, we can do a few things. I'm just gonna show you how to do it because it is an interesting technique. So we have our foam volume out over here. And then we just go attribute from volume so attribute from volume over here. Just plug your foam into the second input and your surface, fluid surface, into the first input, just like that. And you'll see it gives you this sort of white layer over there. Currently, the attribute that we're moving over is this CD attribute, but we don't want that. We can just call it something else, like opaque for opacity. And over here, we can just use a color node. And I just want to visualize this, right? So ram from attribute over here opaque and now you can see exactly what we have right what's cool about doing this is that you can use this to drive the opacity of your fluid surface so i'm going to plug this into our fluid surface out over here go up a level to the stage level what i'm going to do is i'm just going to hide the bubbles and the foam volume over here go ahead and use a comma xbu render and you won't see it making any adjustments just yet but if we go into our water over here and then use a geometry property value like this, we can fetch a particular value. So we're gonna choose opaque, that's the thing that we just created. And then we're gonna expand the geometry settings over here and plug this into our opacity. Now this is going to be reversed, but it's going to show you exactly what this does, right? So you can see that we have that value over there and that has full opacity and everything else has zero. We want the reverse of this. So we can actually just use a MTLX invert and that's going to make it look a little bit weird, but if we go up a level and then just re-enable our foam volume, it's going to look a lot better once we actually reintroduce that foam volume. So of course you can make changes again to the foam. It doesn't have to be this high density or that bright, right? So something like that, re-enable the bubbles and we're starting to get something that looks pretty okay. Right, so that's looking pretty cool. Let's go back to re-enabling our glass over here and just take a look at a few issues that we may have. So over here, the issues aren't all that apparent, but if we skip ahead to something like this, then you might start to see that sort of weird faceting. That's just because our actual surface isn't really smooth. So a little trick that we can do over here is under our fluid meshing, where we're doing a Boolean with our glass, we can actually make sure that the glass is cutting out more than it actually should. So what we can use is actually a peak node. Use a peak over here. And a peak node, all it does is it kind of pushes our geometry along its normals. We're going to do a very slight one of 0.01, or sorry, 0, 001, just like that, and take a look at our Boolean. And as you can see, it's now sort of smoothing the surface a lot better. We can do a little bit more, one, two, five, right, just until it's smoothing out the outside quite nicely. Something like that looks good. Okay, so now we go back up to our stage level, and as you can see, we no longer have those weird facets. Anything that you're seeing now is actually just those bubbles that we have. So if we want to hide our bubbles, we can, right? It's just that over there. So it looks a lot better. 
of course, you can make loads and loads and loads of changes to this, right? This is entirely your project, but everything that you need to get a really good looking render is now in place. For example, if you want some bigger bubbles over here, you can very easily do that. So we have our remesh bubbles right over here. We can easily just go down to our scaler, increase the uniform scale to something like one over there, maybe even to one five, something like that. You can make changes to the remesh bubbles. You can do a bit of a smoothing and a bit of an offset to kind of push them apart a little bit. And let's go back up to our stage level and see what that looks like. So as you can see, you now end up with those bigger bubbles in the actual fluid. And over time, they'll all come towards the top and it'll fade off over time. So let's just see at frame 210 what this looks like, right? So you can see it starts to settle. So with everything that we have in place, we actually have a good looking render. The only things that I would like to change now is just to add some sort of roughness or scratches to the glass and then look at motion blur. Right. So let's consider our motion blur. When we use motion blur, there's a few issues that we're going to have. And I'm just going to go over here to the fluid meshing and firstly take a look to see if we even have any velocity on this. Right. If we take a look, it shows that we have velocity. And if we preview it, you'll see that it's just these spheres that actually have velocity. What's happening is that during this process where we go to a VDB, VDBs don't carry velocities with them, because if we did, then we'd need to have a separate velocity volume, but we don't in this case. So what we actually need to do is take the velocities from these particles and transfer them back onto our geometry. But what I actually want is to recalculate these velocities. So I'm just gonna use a trail node over here. With this trail node, we can calculate velocities, set this to compute velocity, and we're going to need to say match by attribute, right? If you take a look at it like this, it's just gonna be a mess because point numbers are changing. And so it thinks that when particle 10 becomes particle 50, that it moved a huge distance when in fact it just changed its number. So we have to say match by attribute, that'll fix that for us. And that over there, we can use on all of our bubbles and we can use it on our actual geometry. So I'm gonna put it over here. So now our phone group still has it and it maintains it right through to the end for our bubbles. So our bubbles now have it, but we're gonna to need to transfer it onto this geometry down here. So we can use an attribute transfer. So we're gonna transfer from our trail node, right? Right over here, onto here. And we just need to tell it what to transfer. All we want is V, just like that. Okay, so now you may think that that would work and we're gonna go up to the stage level and test this. If we go to our camera render settings and then we go over to camera effects and we enable velocity blur over here, then we should have something that works, but I'll show you an issue. Okay, the issue that's going to become apparent is this down here. If you look at the bottom left corner of this glass, you actually have things that are going through the glass. That's because this velocity is going this way and this thinks that it's going in a straight line, right? Like right through the glass. But that's not actually the situation that we have. What we have is velocity hitting and the velocity changes very suddenly and goes that way, right? There's this movement into the surface. Now, when we're looking at velocity blur, and you can actually see this in the actual Houdini documentation, but velocity blur is for straight line velocity, right? So straight velocity. If you have a point and it's moving along a curve, it's velocity motion blur won't be curved. To get curved velocity, you're going to have to use acceleration. So I'm going to go over here just to this trail node over here. And you can see that we actually have a separate option over here, compute acceleration. And if we go to our geometry spreadsheet, you'll see that over here we have V, but we don't actually have acceleration. If we enable it, it'll add this XL, X, Y, and Z. And this actually represents the change in velocity. However, it doesn't work if you're using backward difference. Backward difference compares the previous frame to the current frame to see how much a particle has moved and that's how it calculates velocity. What we need is central difference. This will allow us to use acceleration and acceleration is interesting because it actually follows a curve. You'll have curved motion blur, right? And that's really cool because it doesn't just care about the current velocity of a point, it cares about a point's change in velocity. So we're gonna go down here to our attribute transfer and add Excel to this over here, A-C-C-E-L. And now you can see that we also have this acceleration which has been added to our fluid surface. Go over to the stage level. And over here, we're not gonna use velocity blur, we're gonna use acceleration blur, right? So we're gonna use acceleration blur over there. Now you may not notice a difference and that's because acceleration blur actually works the same way as velocity blur if your geometry time samples are too low. At a value of two, there will be no noticeable difference between velocity blur and acceleration blur. It needs more data to kind of figure out what the curve should look like. So you can push this up to something like five and that's going to give you a curved velocity motion blur. 
right? It's gonna look a lot more realistic for what we're going for. You're still gonna have this slight issue over there and there are ways to fix it, right? One of those ways is to go onto your camera and actually just reduce the amount of motion blur that you have. You can do some tricks and workarounds and things like that, but I'm not gonna go into it too much. As long as you know what the issue is, it's very easy to fix it. So over here, under the shutter open and shutter close, this over here is used to explain how long the camera's shutter opens for and allows light in before it closes, right? So the bigger these values are, the more light is let into the camera and the more blurring you have. If you shorten this, so a shutter open and close of 0.1 and 0.1, this will correct some of your issues, right? You'll still have motion blur, you can still see it, but it's not going to have such intense motion blur that it goes straight through the glass. The other thing that you can do, which is going to potentially help this effect, is to cull any point that happens to be inside of the glass, right? So you have this over here, but what you can do is you can use a group node. So I'm just gonna group over here. And we have our glass down over here, right? This is our glass render. So we can plug our points, so our phone points, into the first input, and our glass into the second input. Over here, changing the group type to points, disabling the base group, and then enabling keep in bounding regions. Then you just go over here, to say bounding object, and any points that move through the object will get culled, right? So this is a useful thing that you can do. Um, sometimes you won't need it. In this situation, it looks like there's no points that are being grouped, but if you wanna be safe, you can even use this peaked version of the glass over here. You can see now it hits some points, and then you can just remove those points, right? So over here, all you have to do is call this something like cull, and then we can use a new blast node over here, plug this in over here, and then just blast those cull points, right? So you'll go from that to that. It'll just narrow in all of those points and then use this as an input for everything, right? So you can actually just select everything that's being used as an input here and drag it over to the cull, right? So that's going to work a little bit better. You won't have bubbles that kind of go through the glass or anything like that. It's just a slightly nicer workflow. Okay, so back up at the stage level, let's see what we have. All right, so our render is looking pretty good. Okay, so for the last part, we're just gonna look at how we can make this glass look less perfect. So to do that, we're going to need to have some UVs. So let's go over to our glass render over here. So we're gonna do UVs in the simplest way possible and just use a labs auto UV. You can do proper UVs for this, but we don't really care about it for this part. It's really not important. So by default, it's gonna be a little bit stretched. This is potentially okay, it doesn't really matter but you can make some changes to this. For example, you can decrease the merge threshold to something like 0.3. That's going to give you a few more tiles. It's also gonna give you a few more seams. Now in our situation, we're not really gonna care about seams because this is basically just for scratches and smudges. So it should be okay. We're gonna go up to our stage level. Now, if you have a scratched material or something that you can use, then you can very easily just use an MTLX image, right, this over here. And this is gonna allow you to use different textures. So you can plug textures into your roughness. So you can do something like this, right? So you would just use your file name, you would go and find an image, and then you would put that into the specular roughness, right? So we go in there. And what you would do is you would adjust it with a ramp, right? So you would use a comma ramp parameter, plug that in over there, and then you can really drive the sort of distribution of light and dark areas, right? So white is gonna be highly rough, and black is going to be completely smooth, right? So you can do things like this, where you just have a very slight roughness, right? Now that's gonna be cool for images, but I also want to show you how to use noises. So the other thing that we can do is of course to use noises, but I just wanna disable everything over here because I have found that this recooks every single node um, as if it were running on a new time step. So all that means is that it assumes that we've kind of jumped to this frame, so it recooks everything, and we don't want that, so we're just gonna disable everything here, so bypass, and then only show our glass, right? Just like that, give it a moment. Okay, so we have our glass over there. Inside of our glass network over here, we're going to start using some noises. Now, fortunately, Houdini has given us access to some noises inside of MTLX, so we're gonna just type noise over here, and over here, you'll see that we have Unified Noise 3D, right? So this actually gives you some options for different noise types. You have options for fractals, things like that. I'm gonna plug this in into our specular roughness. When I do that, you'll see this over here, but this isn't a very good representation of what we have. So what I'm going to do is with this material X Unified Noise selected, I'm gonna press X over here, and that's gonna throw in a visualized node, right? So now it's actually visualizing this as an emissive material. So it's bypassing the actual surface, and showing me just a visualization. 
Now I can work with this MTLX unified noise. What it needs is an object space, right? So it actually needs a position to work on. You can see that it has a position over there. Basically, the way that you can think about this is that a noise pattern needs to be applied to some position, right? And so we need to give it some position in space. We're going to give it to the object space, so position over there. And then, of course, we're going to need to make some changes here. So firstly, the frequency we can push way up, and then you're going to start to see the noise appearing, right? Now, we don't want a Perlin noise, but we may use it for something like smudges. Instead, what we want to do is use a multiply node over here, and then we're going to duplicate this unified noise. So just Alt, click, and drag. This one over here, we're going to use a Wally noise, just like this. And let's multiply these two noises together. So we're going to multiply these two together. We're going to plug that into our specular roughness, and then selecting this MTLX multiply, press X for your visualizer. All right, so it gives you that. And this is just bringing these two noises together into one. So let's give it some offset on either one of them, just so we have something like that. Let's also just use a ramp node. So we're just going to use a karma ramp parameter, and we're going to use it on our Perlin noise, just like this. And let's make some changes. So we're going to bring up the low end like that until we have something that's kind of interesting. Something like that might be cool. So let's just delete this visualize and see what that does for our roughness. As you can see, it gives our glass this sort of frosted look, right? And this is okay, but it's a bit much and it doesn't really show us what we want, which is kind of like scratches almost. But this is good for that sort of smudging look that we might have on glass. So we'll keep some of it, right? The only thing that we're going to do is use another multiplier over here so that we can scale this effect down, right? And this is gonna come through as a vector three. And this is simply because of the way that we've set this up. So if you take a look over here, these green connectors mean vectors, these turquoise connectors mean floats, right? And you can see that it actually comes into our ramp as a float, but leaves as a vector. And now when you use things like multiplies, the first input is what is output. So we have a vector coming into first input, but a float coming into second input. And if we switch these around, it'll actually change that, right? So we'll actually have it the other way around. So let's do that. We'll put vector into second input, float into first input. That's going to change this output to a float. And then our multiplier will just have a single value that we can change, right? So this is fine. So now we can reduce this. Just keeping in mind that black is going to be perfectly shiny and white is going to be completely rough. Okay, so now let's make a duplicate of this unified noise over here. This one we're going to set to fractal. Right, we can once again change the offset of it just to some value like that. Let's plug this directly into our specular roughness just so that we can see what it's doing and press X on the MTLX unified noise to visualize it. Okay, so fractal patterns are going to look like this, but you can actually change the detail in it by going over to the octaves and black linearity. So let's increase the octaves up to a value like that. And let's also increase this until we have some good noise inside of that. We're also going to push up the diminish that's going to almost blur it out and spread it out. And then we just want to multiply that with another noise. So we're gonna duplicate it down. We're gonna change this from a fractal to once again, a Wally noise, duplicate the multiply, and let's just multiply these two together. Plug that in to your specular roughness and then press X to visualize. And whichever node you want to visualize, you can just click on it and then press X. So I wanna see our Wally noise over here. So that's currently what it looks like, but I'd like to limit that range. So I'm gonna use a ramp over here. So comma ramp parameter right in here. And then I'm gonna visualize the MTLX multiply and I'll just move the values around on this ramp. So push up this low end and then perhaps decrease the frequency on our Wally noise. And eventually we'll end up with something like that. And that's going to be pretty good for something like scratches. Okay, so we're going to take that and we're going to add it to our existing one over here. But we'd also like to have a multiplier to control the intensity of this. So duplicate this multiplier over, just like that. And then finally, add these two together. So we're going to use an MTLX add and just plug these two in over here. And then output that as specular roughness. We can delete our visualizer and see what we have. So as this clears up, you'll begin to see some noise arising. We can press X on this ad over here to once again visualize it. And you can see we're ending up with something like that. Now, of course, you can make changes to things like your ramp so that you can end up with more values. And just one thing to take note of, these ramps are actually going to have matching values unless we change their names. So this one is ramp over here. We can just change each one's name. So this one 
can be for scratches. So we'll call this one scratches. And that'll just turn it into a separate ramp so that they're not linked. Okay, so our glass has some imperfections now. And then finally, an interesting thing that we can do is just with our scratches, so this bottom one over here, let's go ahead and use an MTLX bump over here. What a bump will do is it'll convert a particular height, so we can give it as just a float, convert it into a normal map that can be fed into our normals. So go over there, and then into the normals. And it's going to be quite intense initially. As you can see, that is much too intense. So we can just scale it down using our scale over here. So you can see that even 0.01 .01 is quite a lot. So just find a value that looks good, right? So something like that. That's just going to add that little bit of distortion on the surface of this. And then you can play around with things like your values over here once more. Cool. So we've added some distortion to the glass. We've added some noise. We can just re-enable everything now. And there we have it. It's basically done. You can still add things like lights or you can rotate your HDRI. So if you were to rotate this over here, you would go over to the transform and rotate around Y because that would be the equivalent of spinning the room. We don't want it to tumble in any random direction. We just want to spin it around the Y axis. So if you do something like 45, it changes the shot quite a lot. All right, so once you're happy with what you have, the last thing that we can look at is just a few of these render settings. So over here, you're going to have a resolution. Now, the higher you push up your resolution, the longer this is going to take to render. And the higher you push up your path trace samples, the longer it's going to take to render. Both of these are going to give you better looking results, right? So pushing up your resolution and pushing up your path traced samples. Each of those are going to have a great impact on the actual quality of your render. Another thing that you can do is if you go down to the image output under filters, you have the denoiser over here. You can use the optics denoiser. And what that'll do is it'll smooth everything out. Now, I tend to be a bit cautious about using the denoiser because you can also lose a lot of your detail. It can assume that little bits of detail are actually just noise and it'll try and remove that. So what you should do is rather use your optics denoiser on either a very clean image, so by pushing this up to maybe 256 or 512, or alternatively by pushing up the resolution. So if you double this resolution, then keep the path trace samples fairly low, then use the NVIDIA Optics Denoiser, you'll get a better result. So let's take a look at that. Let's just double this. And you can see that as it's rendering, it's actually using the Denoiser. But as this goes, you'll see that it cleans it up quite nicely. So there we go. After two minutes, we end up with a really good looking render. And the Optics Denoiser has removed a lot of the noise for us. But because we're at a higher resolution of 2048 by 2048, it shouldn't be mistaking any of our detail for noise. All right, so let's just play around with a few settings and just see some other frames. And once you've enabled the optics denoiser, it is always gonna run in your viewport, but sometimes you don't want that, so you can disable it while you're busy working in your viewport, just to get an idea of what you have. Ah, and my phone wasn't working because I happened to disconnect this by mistake. So just plug that back in, and then the phone should work again. I'm also going to just increase the resolution on that. I want it to be a bit more of a tighter volume. So let's just go over to background, set that to dark, and let's just take a look at this. So I'm going to decrease the uniform scale over here, something like 002. That's cool, over there. And the voxel size of 002 should be fine. Okay. Okay, so that basically brings us to the end of the tutorial. Feel free to also go towards the background and throw on that same sort of noise effect so that you have an imperfect background as well. Um, that's the only thing I might add to that. As for when you finally render this out, if you're having issues with fireflies, I would recommend going over to the color limit over here and decreasing it to a value of about five. It's going to dull your scene, but it's going to remove any of those super bright, noisy areas. Additionally, if you're ending up with areas that are a bit too noisy, you can also go over here to the image output under the pixel filter size. Just increase that to three. What that'll do is it will smooth out areas where there's supposed to be a lot of detail. And sometimes it might get confused between what's supposed to be detail and what's supposed to be bubbles and things like that. So this over here is a good option if you have areas with very high detail, right? So that's going to help in areas of very high detail. And I would recommend rendering this as an overnight render where you push up the path trace samples over here to something like 256. And you can keep the resolution at 2048 and 2048 and then just render it overnight, right? You can also add something like a camera move if you want whatever you want, right? This is your project now. You can even change the color of the fluid. So if you don't want this to be like water, you can change it to something else. So if we just go over here and let's just change this color on our transmission to something like orange, you can even give the foam a bit of that same color. 
and you'll end up with a completely different looking render. You can even revisit the simulation if you'd like. What you can do is you can maybe slow down the amount that you're killing off particles for the foam. So over here, if you were to decrease the amount of killing off of particles, then you'd end up with something that maintains more foam, right? So in this pop up over here, we just have this distribution for life. You can increase this life value over here. You can change the distribution of how many particles stay alive for long. You can do all sorts of things, right? This is a really good setup for basically doing most carbonated drinks. So you can play around with this until you have something that fits your needs. But that's it for this tutorial. So we've come to the end of these three parts. Moving on from here, we're going to be looking at some ocean simulation stuff and large scale simulations. And we're gonna be looking at how your entire mindset changes when you go from small scale to large scale, as at large scale, you actually want to break up your simulations into smaller manageable chunks. And so I'm gonna be showing you how you might do something like that. But that brings us to the end of this part. And so I'll only see you in the new year. I hope you enjoyed this part and I wish you a happy new year. I'll see you soon, bye.